الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبياء وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا ابي القاسم محمد وعلى ال بيت الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب الاسر والزمان روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء واجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولا ولا نتدائم على ادائهم ومنكر فضائلهم الان الى قيام يوم الدين ما بر بشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري وحل لقطه من لساني يفقه قولي for the hastening of the return of our 12th imam imam al hujja one salawat upon muhammad wa ali muhammad allahumma salli ala First off, we extend our congratulations to our 12th Imam, the Imam of our time, and all of the brothers and sisters here tonight as we've gathered to mark the birth anniversary of the 10th Imam, the 10th successor of the Prophet Muhammad Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi alayhimu salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah as we begin this program for tonight that he accept this act of worship from us, that we are given the opportunity to pay our respects to the Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salam in person, especially our 10th Imam in Samara, which is still well a city which is not safe for the followers of Ahlul Bayt salam. And most importantly, that Allah gives us the ability to have the intercession, the shafaat of the 10th Imam and all of the members of the Ahlul Bayt salam, for the success of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt and for the re restoration of all of the shrines of the Ahlul Bayt salam, one salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. This evening as we mark the birth anniversary of the 10th Imam, I want to continue in the discussion that we have been having, the, two, the lecture series that we've been having um, over the last two discussions where we were looking at a hadith from the 5th Imam on the foundations of Islam. Um, and I recognize the fact that the last two sessions I was severely over time in my talking, um, so I'm going to make a very conscious effort tonight to keep it under an hour and a half. Just joking. I'm going to keep it for about 20 to 20, a half an hour maximum. Um, but before I go to the main talk about the 10th Imam tonight, I just want to uh, give us a reminder about the event on Saturday coming up, about the event of Ghadir. Uh, you know, when you look in the Islamic calendar, and Islam really on a whole, first and foremost, you see that although the entire year belongs to Allah, because Allah is the creator of time, but yet he singles out certain times of the year which are related to him. For example, Allah says in the Quran, فَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Remind them of the days of Allah, of the times of Allah. That doesn't mean that other times don't belong to Allah, but certain times are special in Allah's eyes. The earth is Allah's. أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ As Allah says in the Quran, the entire earth, the entire solar system, the universe, Everything in existence belongs to Allah. Everything is special with Allah. You know, you can't say that one planet is better than another planet. They're all creations of Allah. But earth has been chosen by Allah. On earth, certain land has been chosen by Allah. And certain cities are better than other cities in the sight of Allah. So Mecca is much better, let's say, than Botswana. And that's not to diss anybody from Botswana. But it's a fact that Mecca is a better city. That is why the Kaaba is there. Karbala is a better city than Nashville, Tennessee. No problems with Nashville, but Karbala, obviously, you can't compare the two. So sometimes Allah glorifies land in the Quran or in religious teachings. Days are, again, mentioned by Allah in the Quran. Allah talks about the days of Allah. And certain days have a greater importance by Allah than other days. We see this even in the world that we live in. For example, December 26th will come around and it'll be a day of great sales, Boxing Day. It was no different than the 27th or the 25th. It's a day in the calendar, but for some reason, the retailers have chosen that day in Canada to be a day of deals and bargains. Allah does a similar thing, but obviously Allah does not choose days arbitrarily. Allah doesn't just you know, whimsically say, well, today I'm going to make it a special day. Allah chooses certain days and He tells us to revere certain days because of historical events that have taken place which magnify the importance of Allah and obviously things that He holds to be important. One of these days will be this Saturday, day after tomorrow, the day of Ghadir. 
Obviously, I'll go into the discussion on Saturday, but just want to share some of the importance and things that we need to be looking out for on the 18th of Dhul Hijjah. Number one is that we need to ensure that we treat the day as a day of celebration. Hadith tell us to look nice, wear the most expensive clothing we have, look the nicest, make it a day where we give our children gifts, make sure we shower our spouse with gifts, be very open-handed and generous with how much we spend on the day of Ghadir. Really, when we look at the society that we live in and how they celebrate Christmas, Eid al-Ghadir should be no less of a day of celebration. We should have as many festivities, if not more, than what our community members in, you know, in our city celebrate for Christmas. It's a fact that this is an important day. It's the completion of Islam. And if you think about just that and the fact that the hadith of Ahlul Bayt call Eid al-Ghadir as Eid al-Lahi Akbar, the greatest Eid, it far surpasses Eid al-Adha and Eid al-Fitr that we just marked last Friday, Eid al-Adha, and a few months ago, Eid al-Fitr. Ghadir is infinitely more important, and we'll talk about that on Saturday. So we have to ensure that we treat the day as a day of happiness. Happiness, though, in Islam is a bit of a unique thing because sometimes it's haram to fast on Eid. Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Fitr is haram to fast. Not makru, it is forbidden. But Ghadir, Eid al-Ghadir is mustahab to fast. And just to give you two, three examples, one of them is that we're told that fasting on Ghadir wipes out 60 years of our sins. So we all have sins. I'll speak for myself, I have sins. If I don't have time or the ability to do istighfar, to ask Allah forgiveness, if I fast this Saturday, 60 years of my wrong actions can be forgiven by Allah. The second point is actually a typographical error. It, fasting on Ghadir is equal to fasting, not our life. It's equivalent, and Sheikh Abbas Akumi mentions this in Mafatuhul Janan. It's equivalent to fasting the time span that the entire world has been in existence. Now, how long has this world been around? Million years? 10 million years? 50 million? I don't know. How long has this world been in existence? Earth as a planet, how long has Earth been around? We don't know, do we? Do we know how long Earth has been around? How many? Five and a half billion years, brother says. If that's the right number, then fasting on Eid al-Ghadir is equivalent to fasting five and a half billion years. We can't even imagine that. We can't even you know, quantify that number, but that's the reward we can get. And last but not least is it's equivalent to performing 100 Hajj and 100 Umrah, which are fully accepted by Allah. I mean, first of all, we will, let's face it, we'll never be able to do 100 Hajj. Unless you started from the day you became Balig and every year you went and you lived to be 115, 120 years old, you would never do 100 Hajj. And even if I do one Hajj, how do I know it's, complete, it's accepted by Allah? I don't know. But to fast on the Ghadir, 100 Hajj accepted is my reward and 100 Umrah. Again, it's impossible for any of us to ever do 100 Hajj. Rasulullah did one Hajj in his life, maybe two maximum. Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, 25 Hajj, walking every year from Medina to Mecca. Even he didn't do 100. So fasting is again a massive reward. But on the other side, to feed somebody who's fasting, just one example, the hadith tell us that if you were to give somebody food, you're going to give iftar to somebody on the day of Ghadir who fasted, it's equivalent to feeding one million people. So you feed one person, you have fed, you've got the thawab of feeding one million people, but not ordinary people. These are people who are the prophets, the shuhada, and the siddiqeen, the truthful ones and the witnesses. We would never be able to feed a prophet of Allah food, or the shuhada, or the siddiqeen. But to feed one person on the day of Ghadir, to give somebody food, a mu'min, a believer, is equivalent to feeding one million people. That's a huge amount if you think about it. The rewards which are there for fasting on Ghadir. And unfortunately we have biryani before Maghrib. So it kind of causes a problem because do we come for the biryani and eat or do we fast and just smell the food and get the thawab? It's up to you to what you want to do. If you want the thawab of the hajj and the umrah and fasting a billion years 
or you eat the biryani or you have takeout, I don't know. But that's where we're at, that that's the reward for fasting on Ghadir. It's also mustahab to engage in special prayers and supplications, ziyarat. We have three special ziyarat to read on Ghadir, on the day of Ghadir. One is ziyarat Aminullah, which is a very beautiful ziyarat from our fourth imam that he used to recite personally when he would face Najaf or go to Najaf and recite and meet Amir al uh, We also have another very special ziyarat actually taught to us by the imam whose birth we're marking tonight, Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. It's when he was actually summoned to go to meet the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad when he was in, Sam, when he was in Samara. He actually went to Najaf on the 18th of Dhul Hijjah, day of Ghadir, and he made this special ziyarat. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll recite it here because it takes a minimal of one hour to recite. It's very lengthy. But just to give you two points of the ziyarat, if you have time to recite it at home, the 10th Imam gives 33 different verses of the Quran about Imam Ali in the ziyarat and 206 different fadilat of Imam Ali from the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt 200, over 200 marks of distinction of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The battles he fought, the titles he had, the status Allah gave him, all of this is within that ziyarat. It's also mustahab to recite Dua Nudba, very highly recommended on this day of Eid, and to send as many salawat as we can upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad alayhum as salatu was salam. There are many other recommended actions. You can refer to duas.org online if you want to see the list of all the actions. And they're also translated in English, available online. And last but not least for this portion is that we give in charity. It's always good to give money in charity, give time, give our efforts. But on Ghadir, it is a thousand times reward. So if normally giving money in charity has you know, whatever X reward with it, Multiply that reward by a thousand. And we don't know what that number is that Allah has said. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, it's as if you give 7,000, you get back in from Allah. If it's 7,000 or 70,000 or infinite, multiply infinite by a thousand, and that is the reward for giving in charity. And obviously, as we know, and I'll end with this part of this first section, that charity begins at home. Let us ensure that our own family, our community members are taken care of. Locally, we have people who have needs. Let's look after them. Give in charity. Give support to those individuals that need the assistance. And then we can look outside and help other individuals, other communities, other people who are in need of our assistance. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As I mentioned for today, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I know it's also school night. The kids who are here, they have the first week of school. Tomorrow they're back to school tomorrow morning, so I don't want to keep them up too late tonight. Um, but just to talk about the 10th Imam, and really more specifically just about the one aspect that I wanted to reflect on tonight. Um, as a continuation from our two previous sessions that we had, where we were talking about wilaya, authority in Islam. And we had looked at the hadith of the fifth imam where he said that Islam is built upon five on salat and there was a zakat, there was a fasting, there was the hajj and there was the walaya of Ahlul Bayt. And he told the companion Zurara in that hadith that the walaya is the most important of the five because it guides people. It is the foundation of the religion. It is also the one you know, the, the, that, the walaya is what puts everything else in place within Islam. So we looked in our previous discussion at the walaya of Allah, how Allah has supreme authority over us. We touched upon the Prophet of Islam and his authority over the believers, how Allah even tells us. Um, and this was repeated in Ghadir, that an nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim. The Prophet is a, has a greater authority over the believers than we have over ourselves. So in the time of Rasulullah, if a companion were there in front of the Prophet and the Prophet said jump, he would do what the Prophet asked him to do. If the Prophet says divorce your wife, he would do what he was supposed to do. The Prophet would never, never did that as far as I have seen. But ultimately the Prophet is the final authority. Just as Allah tells you and I to do things and we don't understand them, but we follow the order of Allah. After the Prophet, we believe that Allah on the day of Ghadir made the 
uh, through Rasulullah, the major official, uh, you know, one of the la last declarations of Imam Ali's wilayat, his authority. And we talked about the authority of the Imams. I'll give you, give you just one example of the hadith, which show us how devoted some companions were to the Imams. There is a story that takes place at one of the times of either the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth Imam, where the individual, one of the companions, was um, speaking to another individual whose faith may not have been too strong in the Ahlul Bayt. And the, the one whose faith was very powerful, he was talking about what level of devotion and commitment he had to the Imam of his time. And the example he gave was profound. Just you know, listen to this and think about it. Explaining the walaya of the Imam, this companion says that I have such conviction in the authority of the Imam of my time that were there to be a pomegranate brought to me, one pomegranate that was grown on a tree, and that tree was in an orchard of hundreds of trees, all of those trees were watered by the same rain, cultivated by the same farmer, maintained by the same wind, but I was to split that pomegranate open, and the imam of my time were to tell me that half of that pomegranate is haram for you to eat, the other half is halal, the companion says, I wouldn't doubt my imam and I would keep away from the half that he told me was haram and I would only eat the half that is halal. That's the level of devotion that the imams of Ahlul Bayt expect from us. That we don't question them when they say to do something. And we don't question when they do something. It might not seem rational or logical, especially for you and I, you know, 1400 years after the fact or 1200 years after they have, you know, been around amongst us on earth. It may not seem logical, but we have to realize that what they do is for a wisdom. They have a reason why they do everything that they do. And if we can get to that level of complete submission, of not questioning their authority, then we've reached to that stage of the great companions of the Imams where they did not doubt the Imam's words. And obviously for us it might be difficult, it's very abstract, but keep in mind our thoughts every day should be that our 12th Imam will come. And if he were to come tomorrow or right now, would we have that level of conviction that the earlier companions had to their imams? Where imam could you know, tell you to do something and you would do it without even a second thought in your mind. So tonight I just want to go very briefly over the authority after the imams. What happens in Islam after the 12 imams? We know our 12th imam is alive. He's not physically here that you and I can talk to him. He is physically on earth. We don't believe he's hiding. You know, some Muslims, including our Shias, believe he's hiding in Bermuda Triangle. I don't know where they got this from, but they've got this phenomenon. They have this belief. And if they have that thought, it's completely erroneous. He's not hiding in an island in Greenland or the Green Island or any of these things. He is very much on earth, walking amongst us. We might not see him in Edmonton, but if you go for Hajj, he's in Hajj every year. You go to Iraq, he's in Masjid al-Sahla. He is around us. But we don't have connection to the Imam. Like, you know, the first uh, 11 Imams and their companions and people had. But we realize that Islam is the final and complete religion, which we'll talk about on Saturday. Allah completed Islam at one point in time. Allah said on the event of Ghadir that today I have completed Islam. I've completed this faith and I'm happy with Islam as your religion. So if Islam is final and complete, and when we come into Islam, or we are born into Islam and we accept it, then we know that we have certain practices we have to follow. We have certain beliefs that we have to accept. We have certain ethical areas that we have to excel in. Where do we gain all of the understanding of these teachings? Islam, really, and all of religion are broken up into these three categories. Theology, aqaid, ethics, akhlaq, and jurisprudence, the ahkam. And this is even clear in Surah Nu, in the chapter about Prophet Noah, where he tells his people, you know, that I've come to you for three reasons. <inaudible> Follow Allah, aqaid, and worship Allah, jurisprudence. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, it, have the taqwa of Allah, akhlaq, and, what, and obey Allah, worship Allah, jurisprudence. Our madrasa students know, and we all know that aqaid, you, you and I cannot do taqlid, right? We can't follow our marja. 
We can't follow our mom and dad because they say that Allah is one, because heaven and hell exist. Right? So we as a community, as individuals, need to understand at our level of an, an understanding. We don't have to get to the level of philosophers and you know, the academics of the world to prove God or the day of judgment. But we need to know why we believe what we believe based on our own understanding. We can't, do, we can't follow any other scholar in that area. Akhlaq, Islamic ethics are pretty clear. I mean, you can look in the Quran. Many of the teachings are there. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that stealing is a bad action. You know, it doesn't take a philosophy major to know that to kill somebody is a bad act. These ethical and maybe also bordering on jurisprudential are clear to all of us. But when it comes to ahkam, the jurisprudence, this is where problems come up. This is where confusion comes up in our mind. Today, if our children, if us, if we did not know to follow a marja, we would not know that fajr is two rakat. Right now we prayed Maghrib and Isha, three and four rakat, but why did we do it? Right? Nobody here in this room can point me to a verse of the Quran where Allah said, O you who believe, perform three rakat for Maghrib, because it doesn't exist in the Quran. Right? Nobody can tell me why they pray three rakat other than to say, because my marja told me so. And you know what? That's a valid reason. Because in the system that our Imams gave us, they recognized the fact that the 12th Imam would be away from our, our eyes. And we had to live, we had to continue as believers following the complete religion of Islam. So what would, they, what, what, what would they want us to do? Just throw darts at a dartboard and pick rulings as they come to us? You know, I explained to one brother the other day that were, was, were, you know, if Islam were to be at our own whims, each and every Muslim in the world would open up the Quran, open up the Hadith, and you'd have, in a room of 50 people, you'd have 50 different versions of Islam. Because we would all decide what we wanted to do based on our understanding and based on our own personal desires. Right? So somebody would say, well, I think Islam is this. He would say, I think Islam is this. And we'd all be doing our own little thing. One person would be praying this direction, somebody would be praying the other way, one person would pray that direction. Somebody would just meditate in a corner for a few minutes. Somebody would pray this wet method. How do we come to a conclusion in the time where we don't have a direct guide to guide us? We have three options within our teachings. We have either A, we become mujtahids. You know, we all leave and we go study Islamic law. Spend 30 years to dedicate to learn that two rakat for fajr. Or we can practice precaution, which is equally impossible. Because precaution means that you take the ruling of every single marja that is living in your era and your, whatever you want to do, you base it on the most difficult out of all of those scholars. So today as an example, in 2017, we have roughly speaking 20 different maraja taqlid in the world today. Not only in Najaf, but in Iran there's so many, in Karbala we have some. So being precautionary means you open up their books of Islamic law on every ruling that you want to follow. And you find who has the most difficult rule out of all 20, let's say, and you follow that ruling for praying, for fasting, for hajj, for khums, for zakat, for marriage, for divorce, for every action you want to do from the time that you wake till the time you sleep. It's impossible. Even today with computer software that we have, you can't do it easily. You can't just do a, you know, there's no formulas you can punch in to get the most difficult out of all the scholars. It doesn't exist until today. So we don't have any other option except that we find somebody, a scholar who has done the research for us. We ask them, what is the opinion of your research? You've studied for 50 years. How do I pray Fajr? We do it every day. My car breaks down. I don't go on YouTube and find a video how to fix it. I might change a light bulb like that or fix little things, sure, but I won't go and, you know, do a major overhaul in my car just by Googling a video. Right? I don't do anything like that in life. I don't even Google my own medicine. Right? I might go online and see, okay, if I have this symptom, maybe this is what's wrong with me, but I'm not going to go and just take medicine off the shelf and pick and choose. So we have a concept of ijtihad, of marja'iya, of walaya of the scholars, authority of the scholars over us, in the period of the absence of our 12th Imam. To make this discussion short, let me just go over one or two things. One is that our scholars are not just there 
how to pray, teach us how to fast, how to go to the bathroom. Those are important issues. But they address contemporary issues. People ask about cloning, stem cell research, investments. How do you deal with all of these things in an ever-changing environment that we live in? Scholars have rulings on these issues. Internet, scholars, Ayatollah Sayyid Tabatabai Hakim in Najaf, he has a whole book, Ahkam of Internet and Cyberspace. How to and what to do and what you can't do online, in the internet, on social media. He has all the rules for his, scholar, his followers he's covered. So they address contemporary issues for us that, again, were we to just choose random rulings out of a hat, we would not be able to fulfill our obligation to Allah. They also unify us as a community globally. Yes, we have differences in the moon sighting in terms of the scholars and their opinions, and sometimes we might have Eid one day, and another community down the street may do Eid another day, or within the same family. But overall, we have a underlying unity in our community. We all pray the same way. All of the ahkam, the rulings that we do, there are very, very, very few differences. They unify us in a way that we may not even realize today. And another way that they protect us and they protect Islam is from the intellectual, the economic, and political onslaught. When non-Muslims, uh, political writers and thinkers can stand up and say that Iraq would have gone into complete civil war had it not been for the statements of Ayatollah Sistani uniting the Shia and Sunni together and urging them to work together to not only remove the occupying force, but to also, when it came to Daesh and ISIS, to fight against them, had that fatwa of Sayyid Sistani not been given, Iraq would have been a different you know, country today, and Syria would be different, and even the Western countries would be different. But really, the world owes the mar marja'iyat, including Ayatollah Sistani, they owe him for giving these kinds of rulings and having followers that were willing to give their life up to protect their homeland. Right? So they protect us from political, economic onslaughts, as the very famous fatwa of Mirza Shirazi in the, in the early 1900s, where he made a fatwa um, making tobacco haram in Iran at that time, or for all of his followers, due to the British encroachment on the Iraq, Iranian tobacco industry. He literally passed a fatwa that said, from today onwards, the usage of tobacco is haram and is equivalent to white fighting war against the 12th Imam. To the point where the, the king of Iran, his wife, was throwing his tobacco out. And he got upset. He said, why are you throwing out my tobacco and my pipe? Who gave you the right? Who made this haram? And you know what her response was? She was the wife of the king of Iran at that time, early 1900s. She said that the same man that made you and I halal for one another through nikah, has made tobacco haram for us today. Right. It wasn't anything, but it was due to the economic encroachment of the British wanting to take the tobacco from Iran, export it to England, make it into cigarettes, and then re-import it back into Iran at huge profits. And that would have decimated the community of the followers. So he made that fatwa. So they protect us as a religion and as a community from onslaughts of you know, the belligerent forces that are working against our religion. I'm going to close in the last next two minutes with just a hadith from our 10th Imam to show us the level of devotion of the scholars that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have. Right? Because Imams realize that they would need to have scholars to protect this religion in the latter day. They knew that, and especially the 10th Imam, he knew he would be killed. He knew his son, the 11th Imam, would be killed. And it was just a matter of one Imam Right? 10th Imam, 11th and 12th. It was only one Imam buffer until the 12th Imam would come, go into Ghaybat, and there would be no other Imam on earth to be directly in contact with. So the 10th Imam was laying groundwork to teach the community, teach us what to do in the, in the time of the Ghaybat of his grandson, the 12th Imam. And so I'll just share one hadith with us and we'll close tonight. The hadith is quite lengthy, so I've broken it up into a few pieces. The 10th Imam, Imam al-Hadi, alayhi salatu wasalam, has said the following statement. He says that if after the occultation of your qa'im, meaning the 12th Imam, there were not to remain a person from amongst the scholars 
who have certain traits. And look at the traits the Imam gives to the ulama. One, they invite others to him, towards the Imam. Or it could also mean invites others to Allah. They guide others to him, to the Imam. Or again, they guide to Allah. Number three, they defend Allah's religion by the proofs of Allah. So scholars of Islam, their goal is to guide to the religion, to teach, but also to defend, defend this religion. Intellectual defense, not militarily combat. To intellectually defend Islam against the isms, cultural, you know, the, all the secularism, materialism, commercialism, every ism. The scholars are obligated to protect this religion. And the fourth thing, to rescue the downtrodden servants of Allah from the snares of Satan and his hordes and the traps of the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. So we have to appreciate, and I'll talk about this on Ghadir, the challenges our scholars have faced over the last 13, 12, 13 centuries in defense of Islam and protecting the followers of Ahlul Bayt from the enemies, those who want us to give up the family of the Prophet and go towards other personalities. The scholars have been responsible for preserving our identity as Shia Ithna Asharis. The 10th Imam says that these four traits were there within the scholars. Had, there not, had these scholars not been there, had ulama not been there who do these four traits, he says that there, were, there would not remain a single person on earth except that he would have left the religion of Allah. So really, our adherence to Islam is because of the scholarship of the last 1200 years. Not just the scholars of today, but we are just continuing a tradition from scholars who have given their lives for this religion. Literally who have spent 40, 50 years to research, to write one book. And again, I'll talk about that on Saturday. And I'll end with this last slide. The 10th Imam says, however, these scholars take it upon themselves to be the protectors of the hearts of our downtrodden Shia. Just as the captain of a boat takes control of the lives and safety of those on his ship. Thus these scholars are the best people in the sight of Allah, the noble and the grand. Now obviously the, and I, I'll conclude here, I don't want to go too much into a discussion, but this description that the 10th Imam gave is not just your you know, everyday run-of-the-mill scholar individual because many people may claim scholarship, dress like the scholars, speak like the scholars. These are obviously certain individuals the Imams are talking about. There are people who are active in this field, who are protecting, who are actively serving the time during the time of the Ghaiba, the 12th Imam. And obviously once we find those sorts of scholars, especially the, the Maraja that we follow, wherever they may be and whoever they are, once they're at that level of being acclaimed and known in our communities as being a source of emulation, we need to ensure as believers that we attach ourselves to them. That we, when we go for ziyarat, whether it's to whatever city, but if they live in that city, we have to make an effort to meet our marja, to you know, speak to him, to get advice from them, get you know, guidance from them. It's not just about, here's my money, take it, my homes, give me the receipt. It should be that we have a relationship, that we ask them questions, we have personal issues, that we can get to a level where we can be at one with them. We maybe you know, go to their homes, sit with them, learn about them, know about them. And if we get to that level of being that close to the marja'iyya, to our maraja who have literally given up their entire lives for our guidance, then that walaya, that authority that they have, it will be easy for you and I to now transfer that authority to the 12th Imam when he returns. It won't be difficult because we would have been accustomed to following an authority. And when that happens, when the 12th Imam returns and authority goes back to him, then obviously that is the greatest thing that we can ever achieve, is to be ones who can be in the full service of our 12th Imam. I'll close here and we ask Allah on this blessed evening as we mark the birth of our 10th Imam, that once again Allah accept this very small act of worship from us tonight. We ask Allah to accept our acts of obedience in this month of Dhul Hijjah. We ask Allah to give us each and all the ability, the life to see the month of Muharram, to lament over the tragedy of Karbala. And we ask Allah that each and every one of us that we can in some way or another serve whatever community that we belong to in the service of Abu Abdullah, whether it be in whatever area of the service of the community that Imam Hussein would expect from us, 
We ask Allah to give all of us the ability to serve Imam Hussein in this month of Muharram and that we can become reformed just as Aba Abdullah was seeking to reform the Ummah, that we can reform ourselves through the message and the tragedy of Karbala. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta Let us conclude by